Well, I'm starting from pessimism. Uh, I'm starting from the point of view that um, this is not a period of um, uh, progress, it's not a period of revolution, it's not a period of reform. It's a period of counter-reforms. It's a period in which uh, reaction is advancing and the left uh, is retreating, and in the UK at least, um, grinding through attrition down to the scale of dust. Um, and the... Uh, I think the fact of the matter is that um, the scale of previous defeats had kind of eluded us. Um, for a long period of time, we were able to say that, well, you know, what will happen is that there will be a big crisis of capitalism, and then you will see, then the vapors of neoliberal ideology will lift, and the working class will realize its true subjectivity and will take to the streets and to the picket lines. We get the worst crisis. In capitalism in generations and nothing happens and the right are the major beneficiaries well, there are specific reasons for that in the UK but I think a general factor that you can see is that the organizations of the left particularly the organizations that propped up the left uh, which were small uh, poorly rooted socially in the UK it was the Trotskyist uh, groups were bearing a burden of responsibility that they couldn't possibly carry. Um, and when uh, the credit crunch struck, and it was uh, their responsibility to try to organize something, they, they didn't do it. Uh, instead, they pursued their own narrow initiatives, and they fought among one another, and they had their own crises. Um, so uh, my view is that uh, there is going to be nothing until we adjust our eyes to the facts of the situation and then commit to a process of reconstruction on the lines of a generation. It will take a generation to reconstruct a habitable, viable left. Yeah, I actually agree broadly with Richard's um, perspective, but to me that's actually cause for optimism, at least in the U.S. context. Whereas we were coming from um, a much weaker position than the UK was coming from. If you consider, let's say, the response, initial response to uh, Thatcherism in the United Kingdom um, up through the anti-cuts campaigns and, and the other um, you know, the social upheaval of the 1980s, we never had anything similar in response to Reaganism. So occasionally we'll compare things like our air traffic controller strike and a few other um, you know, there's some good movement stuff like the anti-apartheid uh, campaigns of the 80s, the Jesse Jackson campaigns, but these are just minor, minor blips compared to the situation in the United Kingdom. So by comparison, our response to austerity, um, though, you know, objectively very muted, um, is actually significant progress. So we've seen new upsurges of public sector unionism in the United States. And traditionally, the public sector uh, unions were much more quiescent compared to the, um, the private sector unions and, and just in general, the, the malaise of the U.S. labor movement, which has always been rooted in a uh, very bureaucratic business unionism by and large, um, partially because of the structure of our union movement. Um, we're seeing some rank and file activity and, and little um, upsurges in the ter terms of the fast food worker movement and other things that we could be optimistic about. Um, I also think that, you know, obviously it's been talked to, um, to death about, about this, but Occupy and its emergence shows that there is, um, you know, some semblance in the United States um, that inequity is a problem and can be taken on and confronted from the left. Of course, we also see the danger of the right co-opting these discourses and taking a problem that needs to be solved through class struggle and class organization and turning it into something that they could technocratically tweak away with, you know, World Bank and IMF platforms and, and whatnot. But in general, I think there's cause for optimism on the U.S. left just because there's been reminders recently that people everywhere, even in the heart of capitalism in the United States, resist exploitation and domination and when they have something like Occupy to point to, when they have something like the Black Lives Matter movement to point to, they orient themselves towards these movements and they broadly support them. Maybe not enough of them are in the streets actively organized with them, but if you look at polling of public perception in key communities on these movements, Occupy, for example, vastly outpolled in public support what people thought about the 
Tea Party. And I think that shows some broad underlying class consciousness. And it's going to take at least a generation, if not more, to build a viable left out of this in the United States. But I think it's a reminder to everyone involved in trying to construct alternatives for a better world that if we're not too dogmatic, if we stick to uh, some sort of hope and optimism that you know people are rational, they're not idiots, and we can't condescend to them, we can organize with them, um, not at them, I think that poses um, you know uh, questions that I think the US left has generally come up with pretty healthy answers to in the last two, three years, and hopefully this process will continue into the future. Well, I, I would say um, that the left needs to follow where people are already organizing and struggling. And obviously, this is sometimes derided in the left as kind of tailing movements, but there really isn't any other alternative, I think, than to actually go where there's, there's energy and contribute constructively um, to those processes, not to build front groups, not to build uh, small cadre organizations by ones and twos, but see where we could actually um, invest time and energy as real organizers and in, in building um, new organizations that speak directly to people's um, experiences and aspirations. And I think in the United States, you saw this with formations like CORE, which is a rank and file caucus that took over the Chicago Teachers Union. Because this was a slow process of which, um, you know, many Trotskyists, many other leftists were involved from the very beginning initiating this organization, but they weren't doing it just as a shortcut or a, a substitute to try to siphon people into their own respective organizations. They were doing this because they genuinely wanted to root a movement in with the needs of these public sector teachers, but also in this broader community. And I still think that's where the orientation of the left needs to be um, in the United States, especially around issues of uh, police brutality and the other forms of state violence inflicted on um, primarily the, um, the black community in the United States, but also on um, just initiating the process of rank and file activity among, among um, you know, workers. And I think that, that what's really important to remember is that, especially in places like the United States, nobody's is necessarily rejecting the left. The left isn't an option. The left doesn't exist. The left isn't relevant to people. So when they think about fighting for a more just future for themselves and their family, when they think about the options available to them, what is available often is communities and kingship networks and, and other things. Uh, Class struggle isn't on the agenda because of the past failure of the left, and we have to present those choices by building things like rank and file caucuses, by building even, you know, even explicitly red unions. If there's, if we're doing a drive and we're in an area where there's no real, the trade union federations that, that predominate the U.S. labor movement aren't a presence or a force, and there's huge swaths of the country where that's the case. I we would be perfectly okay with with building explicitly radical unions as long as there's support for that among among the workers being organized. And I, I think that you know we might very well be surprised because we've been so used to losing and losing and losing that uh, basic messages about um, workplace rights, uh, wages, benefits, but broader community issues like actually do have popular resonance. It's just a matter of going out and, and doing things. Um, and one brief thing is, I know this has been kind of overstated, um, but you know, even something, let's say, like the Samus or Want um, election, which of course is a very minor election in a you know, not even extremely significant city in the United States. Um, that's my New York chauvinism coming out, but it is, you know, in population and, and whatnot. Seattle isn't uh, a major, major hub. Um, it just shows, I think, the, the benefits of what happens when you just go out there and contest and do things. And instead of just the old way of, of organizing, which sometimes, you know, on the left, you have a meeting just to decide when you're other meeting is, and if a argument or a split doesn't come out of that meeting, then it's been a success. Um, I think there's a better way to organize, and I think we're just kind of moving towards that uh, slightly, or at least it seems that you know there's there's ten the tendency, as you put it, is going in the right direction. Well, you say that the narrative has been broken 
But um, what strikes me is just how robust the narrative has been um, and how quickly it has been reconsolidated, you know. Um, <laughs> we had a moment of panic where the banks thought they were going to be fundamentally delegitimized. They thought the system was going to crash. And suddenly sectors of capital were talking about alternatives, you know, not real uh, systemic alternatives, but like maybe a shift back towards an emphasis on industrial production, maybe some more state intervention. That movement went by very quickly. Very quickly the banks organized their counterattack. They have the organic intellectuals embedded within their organizations, not just the private banks, but the banks, the central banks, you know. Um, the financial apparatus is linked to the state, the civil service, and they all mobilized to essentially reinforce the uh, ideological status quo. And that uh, started in the American state apparatuses, the Federal Reserve, and uh, it was spread globally. I mean, they uh, called the G20 and they said, uh, you know, guys, we're not going to go back to the 1930s. We don't want any protectionism. We don't want any um, autarkic uh, sort of uh, breakdown of trade. Um, and we want to keep uh, the um, uh, free trade mechanisms going. Neoliberal globalization. Well, at a national level, uh, this, the same thing was basically done. Uh, so we um, we had a, a huge intervention to bail out the banks. Many people thought that that was the narrative broken, you know, the idea that you can have state intervention. But we misunderstood what neoliberalism was about. It's always intervening, but all the way back to savings and loans. It never stops intervening. The, with the neoliberal state is a big state. It is an interventionist state. But the way it interve in, intervenes, the mode of its intervention is different from the classic social democratic state. It isn't there simply to mediate between labor and capital and to sort of hold the ring between their conflicting demands and to invest uh, sensibly to uh, raise uh, demand and production. Um, but it is to provide investment opportunities for capital. Uh, it is to discipline uh, the labor market, to discipline populations, to morally regulate us through workfare and uh, through private finance initiatives and various other mechanisms. So that has all been doubled down on. That's been compounded. That narrative uh, is resilient. This doesn't mean that it's, uh, you know, the popular acceptance of it is uh, is not has not been disturbed, but what I would say is that the anti-bankers discourse was very swiftly reabsorbed into a new dominant narrative, which was linked to austerity. Ironically, a pro-bankers politics, and the way in which this happened was that they said a lot of people in the economy have been very irresponsible. Uh, and yes, uh, we can talk about the bankers, and we should talk about the bankers, and we'll, we'll stop them having their bonuses for a bit, but the real responsibility is the poor and their feckless spending and borrowing. So when you have um, a culture like, <laughs> like the British culture, um, or anti-culture, where essentially um, we um, seem to be obsessed with de 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 deriving ever new means of um, uh, uh, punishing the poor um, and the uh, precarious. Um, to say that they've been irresponsible and they in fact caused your pain, they caused your crisis, they caused you to lose your house, they caused you to lose your job, they caused you to be insecure. Let's go get them. And now we've got a government which is punishing the disabled, which is punishing single mothers, which is punishing children which is punishing the racially oppressed, and so on. Um, that's, uh, the, the narrative has been compounded in that way, and the oppositional discourse, or the potential elements of an oppositional discourse, have been re-articulated very quickly. That doesn't mean that uh, the, the discourse contains no contradictions, that there aren't ways, uh, pathways for the left to intervene. I think uh, we have um, some elements of an incipient anti-austerity movement in the UK. It's been far too slow to get off the ground. But, you know, with the, the successes of uh, Syriza and hopefully Podemos, well, you might see some of that move forward and then, then we'll see whether the narrative really is or can be broken. In order to talk about allies, we need to know who 
who we are, who who's our base. Um, and that means we need to reappraise the class system and the way in which it's been formed. The truth of the matter is that, um, as we know, um, the institutional organized left has uh, been in terminal decline for a long time. But not just that, the labor movement, the organized labor movement has been in decline. It's not just declining numbers, this is very important. It is the fact that it's increasingly bureaucratized um, to the extent that, you know, if you call a strike um, in the United Kingdom, it's very likely that um, you're going to have a waiting period of several weeks, if not months, before you actually go on strike. Um, and that, and usually it'll be a one-day strike. And quite often it will be in the public sector, and quite often it will be about demonstrating one's potential political clout to the government of the day, um, rather than disrupting anything. So uh, the trade unions have been um, made rendered very timid, and therefore, when we talk about uh, who we are and how we can build, we have to start from the fact that our forces are severely emaciated and domesticated uh, on three years of neoliberalism. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a big disorganized working class. And I think that's where the action's going to be in the United Kingdom, at least. Um, one big issue in the UK um, is uh, the uh, attempt to organize um, groups of workers, call center workers and what have you, who previously have just been ignored by the trade unions. And who's going to do that organizing? It's not going to be the trade union uh, bureaucracies. Um, there have been pop-up unions, and there will undoubtedly be other me me methods, but that will be one zone of activity. Another zone of activity in the UK, you, you know about our crazy housing market. We've got this perpetual housing crisis um, where it's really impossible to live, particularly in the south of England, but it's, it's spreading. Um, and that is drawing uh, whole communities into activity. You know, in Brixton, uh, in South London, there is a big movement against gentrification, against the rich coming in and driving out the poor. Um, and that's going to be an issue. Um, so there will be all sorts of antagonisms and all sorts of issues that drive activism, which uh, aren't along the traditional lines of let's organize in the workplace. But um, if we can somehow articulate those struggles together, um, you know, that's the kind of system of alliances that we will need uh, in Gramsci in terms to succeed. I actually think that there's not necessarily anything that's inherently a left-wing aesthetic or, or whatnot. I think that, you know, culture is is great and important for, for a whole variety of reasons and the left should be engaging with it. But I think that our impact in culture will happen because of the fact that we're building a real political movement out of which maybe we'll even disproportionately be producing uh, writers and artists and other people because, you know, chances are creative, smart people are going to be more drawn to the visions of the left than to, you know, those of reaction. And I say this as, you know, someone of Trinidadian descent who reads V.S. Naipaul all the time. So I know reactionaries can produce good art too, but, um, you know, there's something about the left that draws us to it. But I think the left has focused a bit too long on merely shifting and, and tweaking things in the, the cultural realm and, and as opposed to the very hard, difficult uh, political questions. So some of the things that Richards were, was just uh, mentioning involved, you know, the effect of, let's say, labor law in the U.S. and U.K. on uh, our ability to actually act as um, as we have traditionally acted on the left. So in the U.S., for example, we have solidarity strikes are, are basically outlawed. So we have methods we could use to avoid those laws. We have uh, we could start um, kind of front uh, groups, broader groups from the, the labor movement that, that can circumvent these laws. We have all sorts of tactical questions, all sorts of difficult questions that, that arise from trying to build a political movement. And I think that, you know, yes, the left will, I think, with any luck, uh, politically resurgent left will also have uh, disproportionate influence in, in cultural realms. But I think you start there, uh, then one leads to kind of the other, as opposed to starting with merely shifts in, in the cultural terrain. And obviously that's kind of in itself a crude, um, not particularly dialectical you know, formulation, but I think that's right in the broad strokes. <laughs>
Uh, well, I understand where Mark Fisher is coming from um, because uh, what's the alternative that the <laughs> the British left remains um, uh, dull and boring and self-consciously ugly um, and badly dressed? Um, we, you know. Uh, I don't. I agree with Bhaskar. I don't think there's any specific left aesthetic or anything like that, and I don't think we should aspire to it. But um, you know, their uh, movements um, and uh, political tendencies, you do notice a certain kind of style and aesthetic they have. I'll give you an example. You talk about uh, the English Defence League. We were talking mm -hmm. about this before. Uh, the EDL was um, uh, at its height of its significance, um, uh, attractive to young middle class men wearing Stone Island gear. You know, that was the kind of, there was an EDL look. Um, and you know, this was very different from this sort of traditional 40-something uh, saddo male, um, you know, who came dressed in just a, a torn t-shirt and jeans or something, or, you know, hit the right gear and mm -hmm. swastikas. Um, so what I'm saying is that um, political movements uh, sort of t almost spontaneously tend to develop a, a look. Um, I think there is a room. There is a room for um, reviving the idea of uh, proletarian creativity in the sense that um, you know, once upon a time there was a punk movement in the United Kingdom, and there was an idea that you didn't have to have a lot of money to. Do something creative and original, and uh, and and politicized um, uh, with uh, with looks, with fashion, with culture. So um, we could look into that, um, but I think, like Basker, I tend to think that that will be epiphenomenal. Right. That will be an epiphenomenon of a, a wider political engagement. Um, I definitely do think we need to uh, somehow bypass the very staid um, cultural. Um, uh, aesthetic of um, the extant labor movement, mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, 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 the route to that is indirect. It's through politicization, it's through militancy. We're just copying Bolshevik era propaganda posters and things like that. I think we can move beyond um, a lot of that aesthetic towards developing, you know, a rich, yeah. new, or organic yeah. one. But, you know, people forget that a lot of the even a lot of the aesthetic things that people associate with the far right and fascist movements were basically just copied from the left and the German SPD and, you know, just uh, like torchlit marches were ours first. I don't recommend that we, you know, recuperate that, but, um, but yeah, I, th I think there is room for a creative dynamic, new aesthetic on the left, but I think it comes after and with political movements and I think that's where the focus should be at first. I'll probably be much briefer because I have less to say on this, I think, than, than Richard uh, probably does. Um, but, you know, I think that for a long time the left has had the kind of casual expression that we need, a, you know, movement of movements. And I think that's been just a broad perspective, which I think is a little bit too simplistic and easy, or at least it's just a very easy thing to say where you, you say, like, there could be lots of single issue things, but there's no real tension between them. And all we need to do is lop on some some overarching movement of movements thing and will be will be set. Um, I think that the left shouldn't be hostile at all to, to any of this. I think that, you know, even there's there's uh, what we should focus on, though, is building, I think, broadly class movements that aren't class movements in the sense that they fetishize a certain class or identity. So I think there's segments of people on the left who think about, they critique like things like identity pol politics, this old boogeyman in profoundly unpolitical ways and unserious ways. Um, so in other words, when you talk about LGBT uh, movements, you have a core of them, uh, say the human rights campaign in the United States that are predominantly um, you know, bourgeois movements that are fighting for some things that we'll agree with them on, like, for example, uh, marriage equality or whatnot, more legalistic things, of course, we, we support. But then on the other hand, you have a massive activity of, um, let's say, young um, uh, uh, LGBT youth that are uh, fighting to prevent cuts to uh, shelters, 
for for kids who were kicked out of their homes and are just teenagers and now are are in uh, say Michael Bloomberg's New York a couple years ago. The very same week that we had marriage equality in New York State, we had cuts to some of these shelters. So putting forward a class perspective for me means foregrounding the struggles of working class women, of working class LGBT communities, of putting forward the struggles of, of black workers and supporting those movements that are, are very important are intrinsically class movements, things like Black Lives Matter, the class movement, um, and also doing other work in different sectors and spheres and also organizing, for example, the point of production at the same time that you're supporting these, these other movements and making sure that that, that people are, are in militant unions and, and are uh, active in other ways in their communities and are eventually linked up and feel represented by and feel a part of a broader uh, left party rooting the working class. So I think there's no real contradiction or tension. I think there is if you think of these movements um, as something uh, completely disconnected from, from class, in which case I don't think that that's, that's particularly the case. But I think it's important to, on the one hand, um, let's say in the United States this will be you know, very important in the next um, 18 months or so uh, leading up to the presidential election, uh, critique the worst kind of uh, chauvinist um, and misogynistic attacks that are definitely going to happen against Hillary Clinton and other successful uh, women in the, the ruling class, but at the same time explain how uh, Clinton's vision of empowerment and corporate feminism actually runs counter to the interests of ordinary working class women. So I think things like that is how we should approach these issues, focusing on, on a basis that's rooted in class, but isn't rooted in class as some sort of identity category where we're all when we say class, all we do is envision, you know, old, you know, white industrial workers. Um. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, I think um, uh, I'm reminded of what Stuart Hall said about uh, class in Britain and that uh, for uh, black people in Britain, race was the primary modality in which class was experienced. I think that is quite obviously true um, if you look at the way in which race structures access to employment, structures uh, experience of education, structures interactions with police and uh, repressive state apparatuses, access to benefits, the public sector, uh, housing, all that. Uh, so, um, you know, one cannot really talk sensibly uh, to people about their class experience without talking about uh, the modalities in which their class experience is lived. Um, and that can be gendered, it can be raced, uh, it can uh, sort of exert itself through sexuality and the regulation of sexuality. Um, it can take a national uh, dimension, all sorts of things. So um, we shouldn't talk about class uh, as if it was, uh, as if it was possible to have a pure class, uh, you know, uh, uh, Althusser uh, used the metaphor, metaphor of um, the final instance. In the final instance, the economic is determinant, that is the labor capital relation. But the lonely hour of the final instance never arrives. Uh, it is always overdetermined by other things, by the political, by the ideological, by the structuring influence of gender, race, and uh, other interpolations. Um, so, if we are going to build a coalition of, let's call it the 99%, I mean, you know, that's a populist designation, mm -hmm. but it'll do, <laughs> I think it'll do for now. Um, but if we're going to build that, it's going to be built by, uh, you know, I mean, that would be a coalition of the working class majority, I think, um, and its allies, if you like. Um, but it would be a coalition of people who are um, uh, radicalized on the basis of being uh, subject to racial oppression, or who are radicalized by feminism, or who are radicalized as part of the LGBT struggle, or as part of the anti-war struggle, or as part of the pro-Palestine struggle, or for any number of reasons. So a, a coalition of the working class majority would be a, a, a unity in difference, right? It would be a unity in contradiction. Um, and finding the correct format to uh, articulate all those things. Um, I don't think it's an organizational question. I mean, I used to try to think about this in organizational terms, and I thought, okay, social movements is obviously the answer. And yeah, that's true to an extent, but actually the problem is political. 
do you have the politics that can articulate all these um, diverse movements? Uh, I, I don't think intersectionality in its predominant form can uh, cohere uh, these various axes of antagonism and exploitation and struggle. Um, but I, I think uh, that, uh, I mean, I come from a sort of Marxist Gramscian perspective, and I think that uh, a, a form of organizing informed by that kind of politics uh, can take us forward. And obviously I'm open to any other forms of politics that can help take us forward in that way. context, I think one of the main differences that we had in the U.S. is that the Democratic Party is fundamentally a capitalist party. It's at best, you know, kind of a social liberal uh, party, whereas the labor, you know, it was never a properly, you know, capitalist socialist party. It's why well, I guess Lenin would probably have called it a bourgeois workers party or, or something like that. I think, but still, you know, there was still this structural connection to the working class there was still, you know, I think a legitimate argument to be made that it made sense to, uh, to work within the apparatus of the, the Labour Party, or at least the orientation of a lot of the British left in that direction wasn't completely uh, misguided. And I think you saw the, at least to me, in my knowledge, the uh, disproportionate role of, let's say, um, you know, offshoots of, uh, and people involved in, uh, let's say, militant labor in the anti-cuts um, and anti-pull uh, tax um, movement. And that partially is, I think, a vindication of, of that strategy, or at the very least, just attempting to build a left with real social roots. So even if there were some tactical errors, at least it came from, I think, um, a good position. Whereas the idea of boring within the Democratic Party to push it left and, and whatnot is, I think, much more misguided. And you could apply that to other efforts to boring within certain Green Party formations in, in Europe. I, I think the Green Party in the UK and, and US of, is of slightly a different nature, but these are parties that have no structural connection to the working class, and I think that very much limits what we can do tactically in relation to them. Uh, the only thing I would add to that is that um, uh, the existence of a militant labor wing uh, was obviously very advantageous in one respect, or in various respects. But it came with a, uh, a set of, its own set of problems, and one of those problems was a kind of economism, you know, that ultimately all problems came down to uh, uh, some uh, way to articulate the labor capital relationship properly. The political model, the reason why it's not working is because the political model is based on, okay, we need to, uh, to uh, build an alternative based on the trade union structures. We've got to get the trade unions to build a new Labour Party, but a much more leftier Labour Party. And it doesn't work, um, and it's, uh, that, that model is dead. That's all. I think this question more applies to just um, Podemos uh, as opposed to as opposed to Syriza. I think in the case of Podemos, there's been a, a whole segment of the left who's been, I think, a little bit too quick to um, denounce or, or cast aspersions on on the effort. Because uh, I think the bottom line is the suspicion that we often have on the left is, if not this thing, then something much better would be siphoning all this energy, which I think is nine times out of ten completely incorrect. Uh, so I think Podemos is not draining mass support from the united left. I think it's draining mass support from some type of uh, right of center um, coalition that would have arose in its absence. So. You know, just to preface, you know, my own critique is that, you know, of course, I'm supportive of, of Podemos' effort. I do think there's a tendency to rely on, um, you know, this, this um, kind of 
idea of, of changing discourse, uh, this overemphasis on discourse, uh, I think is a, is a problem. And I think it's also a problem to uh, take all this energy, and I think Podemos, uh, Richard probably has, knows something close to the correct number, but I think it has at least 300,000 um, members. But um, the idea that, um, that these members are, like on the US model, they don't have to pay dues, I think that is um, a step backwards for building something like a, a mass party of, uh, that's really engaging and politicizing people. And I also I would question a lot of um, the model of Podemos, which seems uh, less democratic even than the model of a traditional left party than Syriza in certain uh, respects and the, the role of its main um, you know, a, a coordinating committee or central committee and how it's able to disproportionately influence policies, its relationship to um, some forces on its left wing. So I think that we need to, on the one hand, support a lot of the good discourse and good things happening. So I think it's very good that the left isn't just speaking like, like we're historical reenactors and using old jargon and shorthand that might make sense with conversations among friends. Um, but the, the problem with the left right now, especially the Anglo-American left, is that, you know, we all know each other and we're all friends because there are so few of us. So if we're trying to make articulations and speak to the broad masses, I have no problem with a lot of the rhetoric and discourse that comes out of Podemos, with the one exception of, you know, using, you know, words like patria, which I guess translates, uh, you know, fatherland in, in English, is not very good when you're coming from the core imperialist world. But generally, I think a lot of the articulations speaking to ordinary people and their aspirations or needs, trying to articulate a discourse that's inclusive of, of immigrants and other groups. Um, I think this is all very positive. I do think that this is something that should be added on to um, a party that's rooted uh, really structurally and organically in um, workers and struggles um, as opposed to just being you know, the substance itself. So hopefully Podemos will think about how to um, incorporate other uh, structures and use their mass membership base to actually create a party where there is actually a distinction between the lawyers and doctors in the party and the workers, one of which will be joining a party that's distinctly in their class interests, and the other ones will be joining a party for all sorts of other reasons, a moral and ethical reason. Um, and I think it's a problem when there's no real distinction that everyone's just there for out of some sort of um, you know vague exhortations and it's not there for structural reasons. Yeah, I mean you're right. I think to distinguish between Syriza and Podemos, um, and it's often said, you know, uh, the uh, eminence grise of uh, Podemos is Ernesto Laclau, hence the mm -hmm. uh, excessive discursive approach. And uh, that of uh, Syriza is Polances. And uh, in Syriza, you know, the real problem uh, that you have is the sort of, I mean, I, I, I don't want to uh, impute uh, a consciousness or an ideology to people who don't have it, but you could read it through the lens of saying that um, the right wing of Syriza takes a kind of right Polancian. Uh, approach, which is basically, you know, avoiding ruptures and working on building up alliances, systems of alliances within the state, and you know, um, trying to use these coalitions to uh, disrupt the traditional power networks and gradually achieve reforms and so on. Whereas the left Palancian approach is based very much on the centrality of ruptures as a necessity mm -hmm. um, and its links with uh, uh, counter power outside the state um, and beyond the state. So. Um, uh, I think uh, the problem for um, uh, Podemos, uh, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right, they, they're relying too much on a not passive uh, membership base, but they, it's actually almost structurally de uh, determined to make it as passive as possible um, and too centralized, um, in, you know, in a way that is uh, even less democratic than a traditional democratic centralist party in some ways. Um, so that's a problem, um, and they, that will be an even bigger problem if they enter state power, um, because I think the logical thing for them to do, they will, you know, the governing group would find itself having a lot of affinities with the civil service, with the people trying to run the country, facing all these difficult problems, and they would be fairly detached from the mass roots from which they came. And there would be this structural pressure to uh, to evacuate their agenda 
of um, you know anything uh, um, serious. Um, so um, they are a productive movement uh, in the way this, that you just suggested. Um, I think with Syriza the problem is that um, you know the, it's much more to do with um, the specifics of policy and the specifics of program. Um, uh, they needed to be much more willing to say that if the European Union didn't cut a deal they would walk. They needed to be able to say that. Even if they didn't mean it, they needed to be able to cynically say it. Um, uh, because it was the only way the European Union were going to even consider giving them anything. Um, and uh, uh, alas, they are losing the initiative. And uh, you know, they, are, they have implemented a number of decent reforms, they have made a number of good promises, uh, but now the state is running out of money. Um, and this is the problem when you it's not just uh, about running a capital state with all the pressures that that involves it's about running a capital state that is at the bottom of an imperialist hierarchy inside the European Union where every other state is ganging up on you trying to prevent you from uh, achieving anything I guess the, the author's parents used to say something like, I call, use the word uh, theoretical practice, right, to avoid this very thorny question. So maybe I should just leave it at that. Um, I would say, and you know, this is much more Richard's um, terrain than, than my own, but I would say that there is something to the part of the, the Anderson's you know, thesis and considerations on Western Marxism that we should you know, think about, which is that you know, the, the academia, at least in the mind of a lot of young leftists, it, we think of it as the only place where Marxist theory can happen or is developed. And I think we should get away from that because, in fact, throughout the history of the, the socialist movement, a lot of the most productive theory and a lot of the people involved were not academics. You know, Lenin was a lawyer, not, you know, a professor at the University of, um, of Petrograd or whatever. Um, and I, I do think there is, you know, even within our small groups on the, the left, there, ha there is, you know, a tradition of a very good and very rigorous work uh, coming out of, um, of even, you know, small sex and parties and, you know, just the idea of, of, of that theoretical knowledge coming from different um, sources. So um, I think that part of Anderson's thesis is, is correct and that we should uh, think about um, theory emerging out of, um, you know, if, if let's say even the, the SWP uh, could produce, uh, let's say the to text, I think Prof and the Proletariat, uh, the Harmon text is still an excellent text to examining the phenomenon of political Islam. It's still something we rely on, uh, many of us on the, the US um, left. And if a small group of 5,000 can produce intellectuals capable, you know, very serious uh, texts and even more serious works of theory, then you can imagine what a truly dynamic, um, open and democratic organization of 500,000 would be able to produce. And I think that's where the direction that I would hope uh, Marxist theory would go in the future, away from the enclave of academia, which was at best a place for the new left uh, to retreat for a few decades and back into something more vibrant and dynamic rooted in open democratic organizations but also rooted in in social movements and and you know organic independent intellectuals benefiting from the new terrain of the internet and and other things so you know i i would just hope broadly that's the direction we could go into um in terms of the relationship between theory and practice i think it's important that we uh keep in mind um, uh, the aspiration at least towards a certain relative autonomy. The reason I say that is because, I mean, when you talked about uh, Chris Harvin and the SWP, I mean, I can remember the prophet and the proletariat, and I can also remember some dreadful texts from him <laughs> about philosophy, um, where he tried to lay down a political line mm -hmm. about what kind of philosophy you were allowed to be um, uh, appreciative of. Um, and this doesn't work. Um, we have to allow for um, the uh, idea that, um, uh, at least from Marxism, um, the fundamental questions, you know, there, there is controversy about all of them. There's certainly, I mean, one of the cardinal principles of uh, classical Marxism is the tendency of the rate of profit to fall, but that's hugely contested among mm. Marxists. It's not something that you know one should treat as, um, you know, uh, you know, and it is important uh, for practice. 
um, it's important uh, because it uh, determines how one will evaluate uh, the political economy and how one will um, organize with respect to the working class and so on. So um, uh, these principles matter, but uh, we can't afford to treat them as if uh, they've already been resolved and as if there's no further intellectual or theoretical work to be done. Um, in terms of the uh, division that uh, you refer to between a kind of, uh, uh, I guess, a concern with political economy and with uh, um, uh, labor processes and class formations and so on, uh, on the one hand, and a kind of culturalist uh, uh, problematic on the other, um, there's undoubtedly an element of that, and partly for the reasons that you just mentioned, the fact that um, you know, there's too much concentration in the academia um, and not enough in working class parties. Um, and uh, in the long term, we do need to build, uh, you know, big working class parties uh, which are capable of sustaining organic intellectuals. Um, in the meantime, uh, it seems to me that sometimes some of our best uh, uh, work is produced by academics even if it's of a often highly rarefied character and there's not really much we can do about that um, so at some level we need to um, transform uh, the uh, production of Marxist theory from being something which is uh, first and foremost uh, to fulfill certain academic productivity um, uh, goals um, and turn it into something that is uh, a critical reflection on the practice of uh, socialist organization um, and which um, uh, which is part of a tumultuous democratic debate um, uh, so I mean I think we t I think we were agreeing on this yes. so yeah, yeah I agree I, but it, so the, the question is that the, the, the division of theory and practice is uh, one that's been created by the weakness of the right. left, by the weakness right. of socialist and working class organization, and that can only be overcome through the reconstruction, um, which, um, as I keep banging on about, will take about a generation to uh, make good. Yeah, maybe three. Yeah, maybe. <laughs>